What is astrotheology? Hello, I'm Ted Peters, and I'm glad you are joining me as we ask the question, What is astrotheology? Here at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in Berkeley, California, we have been pressing this question for a decade or longer, working with our good friends and colleagues at NASA and SETI and METI, fostering the creative mutual interaction between theological reflection on the one hand and scientific research on the other. We want to know what we can learn by looking through telescopes and microscopes about God's marvelous, intricate, and immense creation. Well, in what follows, we will take a brief look at the field of astrobiology. We will give special attention to the search for extraterrestrial life within the solar system that's most likely going to be microbial life, if life at all. But then, when we turn away from our solar neighborhood toward the larger Milky Way metropolis, we will take advantage of the discovery since the mid-1990s of thousands of exoplanets. And some of these exoplanets are in the habitable zone, the Goldilocks planets, not too hot, not too cold, <laughs> and rocky with water, uh, to be sure. Is it likely that there is a second genesis of life on those exoplanets? Is it likely that a long evolutionary period followed that led to intelligent creatures, intelligent creatures who invented science and technology? And is it likely that their science and technology will mesh, come together and connect with terrestrial science and technology. That's quite a breathtaking scenario, but oh my goodness, there's good reason to ask about that prospect. How about religious people? Do religious people look forward to greeting new space neighbors and inviting them into our church basements for a covered dish dinner? Or are religious people geocentrists who are jealous of the fact that Copernicus knocked us out of the center and now we have to share our world with all those alien creatures? What? Do religious people actually think about this topic? Then finally, public theology. Public theology is conceived in the church and roughed up and criticized in the academy, in this case, by interacting with the natural sciences and then delivered hopefully as a welcome gift to the wider public. In this case, we have need of space ethics, astroethics that lead to public policy formation as earthlings leave this planet and head for worlds as yet unknown elsewhere in our solar system and in the larger Milky Way. Well, I hope you will buckle your seatbelts. We're going for an exciting ride to the stars.
at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. Bob Russell has for years now advocated CMI, the Creative Mutual Interaction between Natural Science and Theology. In this case, we're looking for a creative mutual interaction between astrobiology and astrotheology. Occasionally, we will offer a doctoral level seminar on astrotheology. Uh, meet Carl Pennypacker. One of our colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, Carl, is a physical cosmologist that specializes in dark energy and dark matter. This is Nate Hallinger, who, then a graduate student, is now a professor at Augsburg College in Minneapolis, and our consultant, Astron, to give us a firsthand account of what it's like to be an alien. A few years back, we published this book, a big, thick book, including chapters by astronomers, astrobiologists, philosophers, ethicists, theologians, trying to fix the paradigm. Just what is the field of astrotheology? What are its sources? What are its tasks? And in abbreviated form, I'll share the results of our research with you in what follows. And we see God through our telescopes? <laughs> Only if God lets us. Carl Sagan had formulated the term exobiology back in the 1970s, I believe, to study life off Earth. Many scientists joke that exobiology became a science without any subject matter because there is no life to study. In the 1990s, the field accelerated due to the discovery of exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars elsewhere in the Milky Way. The name changed to astrobiology, and now it's a field with a number of enthusiastic researchers. NASA released its astrobiology roadmap a couple decades ago, revises it every once in a while, but the three main goals of research or tasks that you'll see repeated is one is search for the origin of life. That's both on Earth as well as off Earth. Search for a second genesis of life. Is it possible that life on Mars is shared with Earth, or is it a second genesis? Third, the expansion of life beyond Earth. Earthlings are travelers. Earthlings are explorers. Should we colonize Mars? Well, that's part of the astrobiologist's agenda. When it comes to life off Earth, it's customary to distinguish between microbial life within our solar system and intelligent life on exoplanets elsewhere in the Milky Way. This is Margaret Race, an exobiologist at SETI. She focuses on the search for microbes within our solar neighborhood. Meet Jennifer Wiseman, NASA astronomer and 
also associated with the AAAS, where she directs a program in which theologians and scientists engage each other. Jennifer is concerned about intelligent life elsewhere in the Milky Way metropolis. We live in a most remarkable period of human existence, she says, with enthusiasm. Exoplanets are now one of the highest priorities of mainstream international space exploration. Notice how astronaut John Glenn is memorialized in the stained glass window in a church. Do space consciousness and an atmosphere of worship belong together? Here is our working definition of astrotheology. Astrotheology is that branch of theology which provides a critical analysis of the contemporary space sciences, combined with an explication of classic doctrines such as creation and eschatology for the purpose of constructing a comprehensive and meaningful understanding of our human situation within an astonishingly immense cosmos. You just heard me say that astrotheology is a branch of theology. It is not in itself a science, even though it engages science. Does astrotheology belong then within systematic theology? You betcha it does. Here is my own magnum opus, God the World's Future, or Systematic Theology. And in the third edition, the most recent edition, there is a chapter on astrotheology. Well, on what sources will the astrotheologian rely? Well, actually, they're the same sources that any systematic theologian relies on, especially if you're a Methodist, Scripture, Tradition, Reason, and Experience. For an Anglican, it's Scripture, Tradition, and Reason. In the case of reason here, quite specifically, the astrotheology is going to incorporate what we learn about the cosmos from the space sciences, most specifically astrobiology. By experience, two things. Number one is a phenomenology of the sky. Have you ever laid on a beach? bright sunny day, looked up at the heavens, you can't see the end. There's a sense in which the sky connotes infinity. So also, on a clear night with no light pollution, the Milky Way just startles you (laughs) with how massive the sky is and how many stars there are. Yeah, space gets into our soul through the sky. It's also the case that the theologian places the science within culture. What happens in culture has a lot to do with the way we translate the data we learn about space into meaningful cultural forms, and the theologian is going to give a lot of attention to that, theology, astrobiology, and culture, interwoven sources. What are the four tasks? the astro-theologian takes up. Number one, geocentrism, or perhaps better formulated, 
what is the scope of God's creation, planet Earth? Well, if you're really concerned about the ecological crisis, oh, you would just love to get people's myopia to expand beyond their own neighborhood, their own nation, to include the whole planet. But planet Earth actually can't be what it is unless we take into account its relationship to the sun. (laughs) 24-7, the sun is pumping energy into the Earth as an open system. And the sun sits within the Milky Way galaxy of perhaps 400 billion other stars. And the Milky Way is just one of what? One or two trillion galaxies? Is that all God's creation? And if it is, does that make you, your and my planet Earth sort of marginal? The second incarnation, the story of salvation as Christians tell it, include the eternal God, the infinite God, taking up residence on planet Earth in space and time, the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Does that one incarnation of God here within terrestrial history count as the saving work for the whole cosmos? Or... Does God have to become incarnated incarnated many times, once for each intelligent civilization? Yeah, that's a question theologians need to ask. Number three, a prophetic critique of the space sciences. We don't want those scientists to get off scot-free without anybody giving them a critical analysis, do we? Well, I'm not going to actually cover number three in this voice thread. We're going to have another one, a separate one. We'll call it the ETI myth. So uh, if you want to check on the critique of the space sciences, watch that voice thread instead of this one. Then number four, astroethics. Astrotheology is public theology, that is to say, it is conceived in the church, it is critically reformulated in interaction with other academic fields, including the sciences, and then finally, it's delivered to the public so that public policy can benefit from theological thinking, so... That is where we're going. Let's turn now to task number one, the scope of God's creation and the place of planet Earth within that creation. Let's introduce into our working vocabulary some principles. The first is the Copernican principle, the easiest formulation is Earth is not special. (laughs) Uh, The Copernican principle actually had a beef against religion. (laughs) Uh, Herman Bondi seems to be the coiner of the term and refers not to an astronomical principle, but rather to a cultural need to decenter planet Earth, the decentering of planet Earth and the demotion of the human race to marginal status in a giant universe. Uh, Copernican principle, is that a scientific or cultural principle? Looks kind of cultural, doesn't it? The cosmological principle, now we're dealing with physics and uh, cosmology. Owen Gingrich, professor of astronomy at Harvard, the cosmological principle says that the universe should be homogenous and uniform, not only in space, but also in time. You need to rely on an assumption such as the cosmological principle 
so that if you're going to gather data about distant galaxies, you have to assume that they're operating according to the same laws of nature that we experience here on Earth. Cosmological principle, very important if scientific research is going to go forward. Now the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle says that Back when the Big Bang banged, the initial conditions were such that eventually, on a habitable planet, life could evolve. Or the strong anthropic principle says it was inevitable that life would evolve. Okay. Does that suggest that you and I, as evolved Homo sapiens, are important? Look what Chris Impey speculates about here. The anthropic principle seems to reverse the Copernican principle, which consigns us to a position of mediocrity in the universe. The anthropic principle asserts that we are in fact special and not just a throw of the dice or a cosmic accident. Well, okay, so these principles don't cohere with one another. I'll just keep that in mind. Geocentrism Should we theologians think of the earth as the center of the cosmos? Should we think of the human race as the center of something? Let's go back to the pre-Copernican theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, who assumed that geographically the earth was in the center of the solar system, the Sun orbited the earth, but he could look up at the sky. He could see other worlds up there. Would any of those other worlds in the Milky Way be inhabited with intelligent creatures? St. Thomas actually asked the many worlds question and answered no. No, there's life on earth and that's it. What was the nature of his argument? Did he read the Bible? And did the Bible say, oh, God created only the earth. Therefore, there's no life on other planets. No, A, the Bible didn't say that. B, St. Thomas didn't get his argument from the Bible. He got it from Aristotle, the philosopher. And Aristotle was arguing on the basis of perfection. Perfect things are singular in character. So a single earth, and by the way, everyone in the era of Thomas Aquinas knew that planet earth was round. The roundness of the singular earth contributes to our treating it as something perfect. And so everything belongs to one world. Everything you see in the sky, the sun, the planets, and the stars, they all belong to our world. It's a philosophical argument based upon the concept of perfection. Eventually, Thomas Aquinas was replaced at the University of Paris with another theologian named John Buridan. John Buridan, still pre-Copernican, he raised the question of other worlds and intelligent life on other planets, considered the same things Thomas did, and came to the opposite 
conclusion. We hold from faith. Interesting faith. Uh, that contrasts with Aristotelian philosophy. We hold from faith that just as God made this world, so God can make another or several worlds. Pre-Copernican theologians debate the question of extraterrestrial life. They come up with different answers. They don't seem to feel a deep need to make human beings the center. Uh, they just sort of assume geographically that the earth was the center, but they don't do so with any kind of passionate defensiveness that I can observe. From 1987 to 2002, the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences, the Vatican Observatory, worked hand in hand on the question of God's action in the natural world. Today, the Vatican Observatory, run by the Jesuits, sponsors a slate of research scientists studying star formation and many other research programs, and has been since the era of Galileo. The Copernican Revolution didn't seem to upset the Vatican Observatory scientists. No, they just sort of march on. They never demand geocentrism, they're quite happy at accepting the location of our planet in this immense universe of ours. So what's the problem again? Theologian Cynthia Chrysdale confronts the geocentrism question in light of the Copernican principle. We have faced this dilemma before, says Dr. Chrysdale. Copernicus and Galileo dethroned the human. Darwin made us mere coincidences of evolution. Slowly, the human race is discovering that we're not the center of the universe, but that both space and time are so fast that we are mere blips on the screen. This won't go down lightly. Theologian Cynthia Chrysdale says the decentering of the Copernican principle won't go down lightly. Tom Wright, the New Testament historian, says, to the contrary, it will go down lightly. It already has. We are not the center of the universe, says N.T. Wright. God is not circling around us. We are circling around God. The earth and we with it go round the Son of God and his cosmic purpose. I think there's a little pun on sun, S-U-N and S-O-N. Oh, yes, the Copernican principle is just fine with Dr. Wright. The editor of the journal Islam and Science, Muzaffar Iqbal, evolutionary biologist and theologian. He'd like to meet neighbors in space as well. Praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds. And those worlds might include yet unencountered intelligent beings living somewhere other than planet Earth. No problems with 
geocentrism here. In light of this conversation about geocentrism and the history of Christian thought with a little Islamic addition, let's ask the following question. If we could confirm the existence of an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization, would that knowledge so undercut traditional religion here on earth that those religious traditions would suffer a crisis and maybe even suffer demolishment? Good question. One way to answer it is to ask the adherents of these religious traditions. I did just that in my Peter's ETI Religious Crisis Survey. Want to find out what I learned? Well, then go to the voice thread, Astro 2, and find the answer. The second task on the astro theologians list is the incarnation. In terrestrial history, God became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth in one time and in one place. And the work of salvation, the forgiveness of sins and the promise of resurrection to everlasting life, the work of salvation was accomplished in the death and the resurrection of the incarnate Son of God. Now, is that historical work applicable to the entire cosmos, which would include intelligent civilizations on other planets that have not to date shared in Earth's history, or would God have to become incarnate again and again once for each intelligent race on each exoplanet so that we'd have one God with many incarnations. Which one of these should the systematic theologian adopt? Here is Paul Tillich. He belongs to the Multiple Incarnation School of Thought, Volume 2 of his Systematic Theology. If there are non-human worlds in which existential estrangement is not only real, but in which there is also a type of awareness of this estrangement, such worlds cannot be without the operation of saving power within them. Incarnation is unique for the special group in which it happens, but not unique in the sense that other singular incarnations for other unique worlds are excluded. Ilya Delio, indefatigable theologian who engages in the scientific challenges, she also joins the multiple incarnation school. To speak of Christ on the level of extraterrestrial life is not to restrict the discussion to Jesus alone, but to see Christ as the icon of created reality. Christ is the divinization of created reality in whatever way the divine word can fully enter into that reality. Astro-theologian Thomas O'Meara, also a multiple incarnationist, as incarnation is an intense form of divine love, would there not be galactic forms of that love? 
An infinite being of generosity would tend to many incarnations rather than to one. Incarnations among extraterrestrials would not be competing with us or with each other. Wolf Hart Pannenberg believes that the historical incarnation of God in Jesus of Nazareth is valid for the entire cosmos. It is hard to see, says Pannenberg, why the discovery of non-terrestrial intelligent beings should be shattering to Christian teaching. If there were such discoveries, they would, of course, pose the task of defining theologically the relation of such beings to the Logos incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, the Logos who works throughout the universe. Well, we have two things going on here, and um, one is that the Logos is closely related to creation. The second person of the Trinity is the Logos, is the mind of God, according to which the entire creation is organized. So the second person of the Trinity is already present everywhere creation is present. Secondly, for Pannenberg, Pannenberg believes that reality is historical in character and that multiple past histories are gradually converging into a single unified history of the cosmos. And I think Pannenberg would add to what we read here that eventually the convergence of histories will incorporate the specific history of the incarnation in Jesus on earth into the grand story, the grand story of the single universe. One incarnation in history is efficacious for the history of all things. Humor takes no prisoners. So here's an earthling and a spaceling in conversation. Both planets have had an incarnation, and the spaceling says, oh, he comes back every two weeks or so. We gave him this big box of chocolates when he first arrived. Why? What did you guys do? Yeah, we crucified him. When the position is advocated, as Pannenberg does, that the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ here on earth is efficacious for the entire cosmos, some critics will want to argue, isn't this another form of geocentrism? As we saw earlier, the broad swath of Christian thinking is not defending geocentrism, even if there might be a few voices here and there that do feel geocentric. Now, after giving up geocentrism, do we put it back by saying that Earth is privileged to be the only place in the history of the cosmos where God has become incarnate? little mudslinging going on there, but, you know, the astral theologian has to entertain all of these questions. Will extraterrestrial intelligent creatures be nice or nasty? Later on, when we get to the ETI myth in a different voice thread, we will think of ETI as nice. Why? According to the ETI myth, 
a civilization more highly evolved, more advanced in science and technology, is also more advanced in morality. And those extraterrestrial civilizations could save us on Earth from self-destruction through, through nuclear war or echo side. Aliens are our celestial saviors. Does physicist Stephen Hawking believe the ETI myth. No. <laughs> he goes for the nastiness. Stephen Hawking suggests that the most that most alien life might be simple microbes or animals, but there could also be intelligent ETs that may set their sights on Earth for their own purposes. I imagine they might exist in massive ships having used up all the resources from their home planet, such Advanced nomads would look to conquer and colonize whatever planets they can reach. They might come to Earth with their military to conquer, exploit, and subjugate. That is physicist Stephen Hawking's speculation. What is the speculation of Robert John Russell? Well, Russell rejects the ETI myth as well. He thinks ETI is likely to be ambiguous just as we are. I predict, says Bob Russell, that when we finally make contact with life in the universe, it will be a lot like us, seeking the good beset by failures, and open to the grace of forgiveness and new life that God offers all creatures. Astro-theologian David Wilkinson comments, I agree with Peters and Russell that our best guess is that ETIs will resemble the ambiguous human condition, good, fallen, and looking for grace. And then he goes on, after examining the Pannenberg position, our review of the different options may not clarify which option is correct, but it does show that Christian theology has the resources to not fear the question. That's the question of a single or multiple incarnations. The Christian conviction is that the God who is encountered in Jesus will do what is necessary. Well, after evaluating these various answers to the question of a single versus multiple incarnations, I am inclined to go with Pannenberg and Bob Russell. With Bob Russell, the condition, the equivalent of the human condition or the ET condition is that more than likely they will not be champions of morality. And on this other hand, they're not categorically militaristic or nasty either, but probably a combination like us pursuing the good tripping up and falling, needing and wanting grace. But I think with Pannenberg that cosmic history is still history, and events within history do have consequences for the whole of reality. God's promise symbolized in the kingdom of God and the new creation, applies cosmic-wide. The fulfillment of that promise is anticipated proleptically in the resurrection of Jesus at Easter. Somehow there's a continuity, a definitive continuity between what happened to Jesus on Easter and God's promise for the eschatological flowering of all things in creation. Maybe I agree with David Wilkinson here. Yeah, God, God will do what is necessary for crying out loud. 
but what is necessary will at least show some affinity, if not continuity, with what we saw in the death and resurrection of Jesus in anticipation of salvation and redemption for all things. Let's refine the question a little bit. In standard Christology and Soteriology, do we see God's incarnation in Jesus as a response to the fall into sin, or alternatively, do we see the incarnation as a perfecting of creation? Russian Orthodox theologian Vladimir Lossky sees the incarnation as a response to the human fall into sin. The fall demands a change, not in God's goal, but in God's means. For the atonement made necessary by our sins is not an end, but a means, the means to the only real goal, deification. Roman Catholic Karl Rahner takes the opposite point of view even if the human race had not fallen into sin, God would still visit planet Earth, so to speak, because God is a self-communicator. In this divine self-communication and in its climax in the incarnation, the world becomes the history of God himself. For Rahner, who actually did entertain the question of extraterrestrial life, he imagines an interaction of ETI with God on each planet and by implication, whether those extraterrestrial creatures are nasty or nice, God would still be engaged in extraterrestrial incarnate self-communication. Meet Stephen Dick, historian for NASA, once held the Klug Chair in Astrobiology at the Library of Congress, Stephen has developed his own cosmo theology. It's a naturalism. The divine is within the cosmos, not transcending the cosmos. Stephen doesn't have a problem with incarnation. The third task of the astro theologian is to provide an internal critique of the space sciences. Characteristically, in the interaction between theology and natural science, the theologian frequently reminds the research scientists of his or her limits. We blow a whistle or sound a horn and wave a flag when the research scientist drifts over the fence into the domain of scientism when inquiry subtly becomes an ideology, a materialistic ideology, and that's when the theolo theologian blows a whistle. In this case, specifically astrobiology, the internal critique looks a little bit differently. We want to point out the ETI myth. You can see here this shirt, t-shirt I bought, the evolutionary story heads towards you and my future, and our future is the extraterrestrial, more highly advanced, more highly evolved creature. That is a myth. It's not scientifically demonstrable. 
It is not the conclusion that an astrobiologist draws after research. No, it functions at the level of assumption. It is a myth. It is a conceptual set. It is an idea or ideal that inspires and directs the scientific research program in itself is not scientific, yet it's myth in the heart of science. Does this contaminate the science of the astrobiologist? I don't think so. <laughs> it's just that the theologian wants to ask the astrobiologist not to practice theology without a license. And so if you would like to learn about the ETI myth, look at our other voice thread, Asto 3, the ETI myth. In the meantime, we're going to go on to the next task, the fourth task of the astro theologian, namely astro ethics. Astro ethics, the fourth task. I like the term astro ethics, but some of my colleagues prefer alternative terms, Jacques Arnaud at uh, the French Space Agency prefers space ethics. Uh, you can see the first name here in the list of editors. Octavio Chantoris, he prefers astrobioethics. Be that as it may, theologians along with other scholars, scientists, and social scientists are trying to draw out the implications of the science of astrobiology for culture in general and public policy specifically. Public policy in this case would deal with the protocols for expanding human life from Earth to off-Earth Sites. So this book is one that we're currently working on in press, should be out shortly. When it comes to ethics, scientists must rely on non-scientists. Here's Grace Wolf Chase, astronomer. Although science can and arguably should inform ethics, science cannot dictate ethics. I'm a theologian, even an astro theologian. As a theologian, I like my ethics to begin with a vision of God's transformed future and then understand ethics as axioms that help us move from the present toward that future. As a public ethicist, I'm looking for common denominators so that people of faith and people without <laughs> my particular form of Christian faith can cooperate. So the kite I'm flying here is an astro ethics of responsibility, starting out with four axioms, which I hope would be acceptable to both the theologian and the non-theologian, to the, someone who believes in God, to the naturalist, and someone who doesn't care particularly much. Let's try this. The moral agent, Earth, that is to say, a single planetary society. Does that single planetary community of moral deliberation exist? No, but... It's a moral goal, is it not? The moral norm, the galactic common good. Oh, as an echo ethicist, I'm looking for the common good for Earth, but now astroethics would have a larger common good, the common good for the Milky Way. Number three, the moral spheres, the solar neighborhood and the Milky Way metropolis each have a 
a certain geographical coherence, we're going to look more for microbial life within the solar neighborhood and at intelligent life in the wider Milky Way metropolis. Number four, moral justification. This is the biggie. Every philosopher has to provide justification for any standard of a right and wrong. Theologians, of course, can appeal to the law of God, but when you're outside the circle of faith, what will you appeal to as your moral justification? Here's the kite I'm flying. A theological apprehension of the common good combined with a naturalistic apprehension of the golden rule. The naturalist and the theologian could agree on the golden rule. That is to say, we're going to treat ETI as we would like them to treat us. I would like to introduce us to astroethics. Don't have the time in this short presentation to deal with everyone in detail. Note again, we've divided astroethics into two moral spheres, our solar neighborhood and the Milky Way metropolis. Within the solar neighborhood, number one, that has been the concern of uh, NASA, uh, the United Nations, Coast Bar, and others is planetary protection. Initially, we're concerned about backward protection. If our astronauts bring rocks home from the moon, we want to protect Earth from getting contaminated by any uh, microbial life that could result in an epidemic. As it turns out, those moon rocks were benign, but we'll want to exact planetary protection protocols when we finally bring um, rocks and sand and physical elements back from Mars. That's backward cam contamination. What about forward contamination? Should we have protocols to protect biospheres? Should we discover them on off-Earth sites, either Mars or one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn? Big question. Number two, intrinsic value of off-Earth biospheres. If we do find a biosphere on a moon of Saturn, should we treat it with intrinsic value, or how about the bulldozer mentality? We'll just exploit it without any regard for its inherent value. Number three, application of the precautionary principle. Borrowing this from ecology, uh, I, uh, making certain that before significant decisions, decisions with great implications are made that uh, all precautions to protect both planet Earth as well as an off-Earth biosphere are taken. Number four, space debris. The wildcat capitalists who have filled our circumterrestrial space with now defunct satellites have left 22,000 pieces of junk, at least. <laughs> and uh, our space is so junky that when we send up rockets, you have to somehow or other negotiate to stay away from colliding with this dangerous stuff. And nobody has asked those who profit from these satellites to pay the bill. What is the morality in that? Number five, satellite surveillance. A lot of those satellites are not looking outward towards, towards space. No, they're looking downward into your and my bedrooms and gathering data, intelligence for military purposes. And right now it's being shared around the world. Are there any privacy concerns and... If so, uh, what kinds of 
policies, and this should really be a worldwide policy, not just the interests of one nation's military over against another, what should those policies be? The weaponization of space, the United Nations uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967 said flatly and categorically, do not place weapons in orbit around the planet. Now, the United States is developing a so-called space force, and uh, certainly China and Russia are interested in weaponizing space. Can we do anything to prevent that? Number seven, scientific versus commercial space exploration. Up until this point, the scientists have been able to use space as their own private sandbox. The scientists have been funded by governments to do research, and they have enjoyed their exclusive right. But recently, commercial space interests are now uh, sending up rockets and establishing satellites and planning mining operations, etc., and How will the exploitation of space work with or against scientific data gathering? Eight and nine, terraforming Mars and colonizing Mars. Mars used to have life, so speculate the NASA Mars scientists. Could there be life again? Could we seed a form of life on Mars that ingests carbon dioxide and exhales oxygen and then later add life forms that inhale oxygen, terraform Mars, make it look a lot like Earth. Number nine, should we colonize Mars, send humans from Earth there, maybe modifying them genetically on the way so that They would be more adaptive to the Martian environment. Number 10, anticipating natural space threats. Not other nations who want to bomb us, but asteroids coming to Earth. Should this single planetary society get together, muster its resources to protect ourselves from destruction by an asteroid or a solar flare. Those are the kinds of issues that already exist. And we need smart minds, data, wisdom, sound judgment. And the moral implications apply to Everyone on Earth, and not just one nation. Everyone on Earth. The previous list of ten quandaries apply primarily to our solar neighborhood. Now let's turn to the Milky Way metropolis. With 4,000 plus exoplanets, now confirmed within the Milky Way and a proportion of those in the habitable zone, the big numbers suggest that we have neighbors, intelligent neighbors. Let's categorize what your and my moral responsibility might be when we meet them. In the near future, it's not likely that we can invite them into our church basement for a covered dish dinner. The light year problem, that is to say, the speed at which we can travel and the distances which must be traversed, make it physically impossible for dropping in on each other's neighborhood. What is more likely, of course, is that SETI or METI will 
set up an interactive communication. But we can still dream, we can still dream that there might be some physical interaction at some point. How should we think about our moral responsibility? I'd like to just start with three categories of ETI. Now, as background from both the systematic theology of medieval Roman Catholicism, we found that the highest dimension of the human being is the mind, the rational mind. So also in the Enlightenment with Immanuel Kant and others, reason is listed, listed as human, the top virtue. So let's use intelligence, the capacity to reason, as our measuring stick. Just as a footnote, I don't believe intelligence is the right measuring stick, but let's let's just conform to what seems to be the agreed-upon criterion. Suppose we engage, number one, ETI who are less intelligent than Homo sapiens on Earth. What then? Would ETI have a moral status similar to the animals here on Earth? Well, we have a schizoid love-hate relationship with our animals. Love-hate, maybe that's too strong. On the one hand, we make animals work and we slaughter them to eat them. That's not exactly hate. It's just lack of compassion. On the other hand, we have pets whom we love and pay extraordinary bills to the veterinarian in order to keep them healthy. Would the moral status then of ETI less intelligent than we are be analogous to our responsibility towards the animals on our planet. Number two, ETI equal to us in intelligence. Well, we in the West, in the Enlightenment era, associate intelligence with dignity. Certainly Immanuel Kant did that, and it's from Kant that we get our doctrine of dignity, which means to treat another person as a moral end and not merely as a mean to some further end, would we then be obligated, if we continue the Enlightenment tradition on Earth, would we be obligated to treat ETI equal intelligence with dignity? We would treat them as having intrinsic value, we would treat them as a moral end and not merely as a means to some further end of our own. We would be prohibited from brute exploitation. We could have commerce, we could have equal exchange to be sure, but not brute exploitation. Then we would have to assess whether these intelligent aliens are nice or nasty. If they're nasty, if they are prone to militarization, we would have to protect ourselves. If they're nice, then we would negotiate contracts for commerce and interaction. Number three. Suppose ETI are superior to us in intelligence. They might be biological like we are, just smarter than we are, or some have speculated that their intelligence might have left their biology and entered the realm of the computer, the computer cloud, that maybe ETR 
ETI are post-biological intelligences living in the computer cloud. Well, <clears throat> we can't decide that until we meet them, of course, but let's analyze this a little bit. ETI are superior to us in intelligence. What then is our moral responsibility? Should we volunteer to be their slaves? If we really believe that intelligence is the measure of superiority, then we would be inferior. Should we develop a slave morality? What if those super intelligent aliens are benevolent? What if they love us? What if they treat us with grace? What if they want to become our celestial savior? Then we would be morally obligated to be grateful, to say thank you. Well, I just point out these lines of reasoning to show that before we meet them, it might be nice if we get our house in order and have some idea of what our moral responsibility is likely to be upon contact. We know that when God says, let there be light, there is light does that include pulling the light switch? Thank you for joining us on this journey. We began with the question, what is astrotheology? We offered an answer and delineated four central tasks for the astrotheologian. One of those tasks was to deal with the pesky problem of geocentrism. How big is God's creation? Anyway, are Christians or other religious people upset that the Copernican principle decenters planet Earth or decenters the human race? We found that for the most part, theologians are quite happy to accept the mediocrity of planet Earth and even the mediocrity of the human race, recognizing the possibility that some creatures on some exoplanets might be smarter than we are. We also took a look at the question of incarnation. Christians believe that God became incarnate in Jesus Christ in time and space here on planet Earth and performed the work of salvation. Now, does that work of salvation on earth apply to everything in the cosmos? All those two trillion other galaxies? Or must God become incarnate for each intelligent species on each planet to reveal to them divine grace, love, and the promise of redemption. Christian theologians need to wrestle with this issue. Non-Christians, yeah, it's not going to bother them. It's going to bother the Christians, though. I hope you've got your mind made up as to which is better, single incarnation or multiple. There were a couple of items that we did not deal with. One was the question, should we confirm the existence of an extraterrestrial intelligent civilization? Would religious traditions here on Earth suffer a crisis? Well, if you want to get the answer to that, look at one of the other voice threads, voice thread astro number two. Another item we did not deal with is the ETI myth a myth in the heart of science, the belief that extraterrestrials will not only be more intelligent than us terrestrials, but 
will come to earth, bringing the blessing, blessings of an advanced science and technology that they will become the saviors of earth. It's a myth. Not scientific yet. It inspires and directs science. If you want to learn more about that, take a look at Astro number three, the ETI myth. Finally, we did take up the issue of astroethics. Astrotheology is public theology. That is to say, it is conceived in the church. It is purified, so to speak, by the to and fro engagement with the natural sciences. And then it is offered to the wider public for public policy. So the wisdom and discernment of theological reflection on ethical issues will contribute, we hope, to public policy discussion about space exploration and space travel. We divided those ethical issues into two categories, dealing with microbial life and space exploration within the solar system, and then dealing with intelligent life on exoplanets. That has been our trip. I hope you've enjoyed it. You can unbuckle that seatbelt now. Bye-bye.